Thank you, Angel. I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. So, is it okay? Can everybody see? The screen? Yeah. Great. So, now I want to thank you again, Angel, everybody from Central Texas Mycological Society, for having me today. It is a pleasure to see you again. I want to thank Daniel Reyes, because guess where are we? At his lab, once again. <laughs> so welcome everybody to the Shibori Mushroom Dye Workshop. And today's program is about practice and also theory. We're going to score, which is to clean up fibers. We are going to mold on it to prepare it for the dye. Then we are going to fold into the Shibori techniques. And finally, we are going to make the dye of Trametis, Marigold, or Anato the ones you, you could gather. I hope many of you have the mushroom. If not, it's perfectly fine. You can use anything else. And at the same time, while these processes are happening in our dye pots, we are going to learn about the dye science, the shibori technique, and also about the mushroom we have today. An overview of the species, the mycological importance, how the pigments are created, and I am going to answer the question can we clone it and have it as a pet in our closets? I will tell you later. So, safety first, I recommend the use of a face mask. COVID ones are perfectly fine. When you are handling soda ash, because soda ash is a very fine powder. That you have, oh, you can see, well, it is a white powder. And it is not toxic or poisonous, but it can irritate the respiratory system. So when we are going to manipulate the soda ash, we're going to wear a mask. I also recommend the use of rubber gloves because our fabrics are going to be hot. So once we have to touch them, we should use the rubber gloves. Wear shoes, not sandals. In case of spill, your feet will be protected. Avoid, avoid cables or anything hanging around that could make you trip because we're handling hot water and it can be really, really hurtful. Um, work in a well-ventilated area. The fumes that will go, that will happen when we clean the fibers or when we are dying with mushroom are not toxic, not poisonous. However, the smell could be a little unpleasant at the beginning. And at last but not least, avoid flammable objects or substances near your heat source whether you are on, your, on the stove top or, where, or using electricity, avoid having anything that could get burned in the surrounding area. So, first, um, we're going to measure all of our ingredients. So while we are talking about the dye science, the fibers are going to be cleaning. For scouring, we have to weight our fibers or fabrics I am going to switch my camera here so you can see it. And I'll leave this on screen so you can see the measurements. It's 2% soda ash and 6% dishwasher soap. Now, if you do not have a weight scale, what can you do? Fabrics, a meter of fabric, of cotton fabric, it usually weighs between 100 grams and 200 grams. Or you can have a percentage if you know the measurements of your fabrics. Or what you can do is to grab a teaspoon and measure the percentage of the dishwasher soap and the soda ash according to the amount of water that you are using. Now, it says one teaspoon for three gallons of water of soda ash. But if you have less than 13 liters, you can use half a teaspoon of soda ash. So let's measure and place everything in the box. There we are. Just there we go. So I have the waste still right here. My fabrics are over here. I'm 
there's my fabrics are 72 grams So I'm going to calculate percentages, which is 72 grams and 2% of soda ash. I have 1.4 grams of soda ash. So my face mask, very important. Well, I couldn't find my face mask. I'll just pull my breath. Would you use your mask? Now, this process is really, really important because all the fabrics, due to the manufacturing process, are covered in wax and also dust and many other things, but mostly wax. We have the soda ash. Now, let's measure the alum. I recommend to write down the weight of your fabrics because we are going to weight the ingredients for more dancing after this. And I mean, is it, a, is it possible to um, stop the screen share? That way we can oh, see yes, of course. So you can see it. Yeah, that'll be helpful for the recording on YouTube. I know on Zoom, everybody, if you want to, you can do a split screen too, if she's sharing screen and demonstrating at the same time. There's a way to um, make your screen 50-50. Now I'll put in the chat the ingredients. That's for screen. Ah, look, that's perfect. Now I'm going to wait. I have the soda ash right here. As you can see, it is a very fine powder. That's why it's better to use a face mask when you handle it. And here is the alum. Now it is in dust form. It's a mineral. But if you purchase it as a rock, it is very easy to grind. And um, four grams. Oops. Oh no, wait. I got confused. Where's curry? No, 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 no. This is going to be the soap. The dishwasher soap. So if you go to the chat, you can see the ingredients here. 2% soda ash and 6% dishwasher soap. Now, this is the best soap that you can use because it has ingredients that will help the wax to break down more easily than if we use any other type of soap. There we go. Now, we have these ingredients. I'm going to turn off my scale. I'm going to have it right here. And I'm going to go get some water for my dye pot. Yesterday I used Brazil wood. That's why we see this crazy purple color. I'm going to go get some water. So now we can place the pot on the heating surface. This, so you can see my pot. There it is. And I'm going to dissolve first the soda ash. Make sure you dissolve all of it. And after that, the dish wash your soap. See it floating around, we are going to solve it. There we go. And I can turn on the heat. Now I place my fibers, my fabrics inside. Here they are. Over them. 
We're making fabric soup. Perfect. And this other one, yeah. Now, you can use one of these kitchen tools or maybe fabric. Whatever you have at hand is going to work well. Make sure your fabric is floating around, free and happy. And there we go. Ready. So now we're going to wait the ingredients for more than two. So we have that ready from now. And I'm going to place this in the chat. There it is. So for more than two, we need 6% of soda ash. No. Oh, here it is. 6% of soda ash and 25% of aloe. If you do not have a weight scale and you know your fabric is one meter long, you can calculate the percentages for 100 grams or use one and a half teaspoons of soda ash and four teaspoons of alum. We're just going to measure those ingredients. We are not going to use them. So soda ash, 6% again. We know of fabrics are 72 grams. One, two, four. That's in. And the alloy. Alu is 25%. For me, there will be 18 grams. So I set them aside and put my ingredients. I mean, there's a few questions in the chat about um, whether you're scouring and then more danting. Yes, we are going to scour first to clean the fibers. And after that, we are going to more dance using soda ash and alum. Now, it is more common to use only alum. However, when you use these two combined, you create a pigment inside the fabric. So the bonds, when you use soda ash, which is an alkaline, and alum potash, which is, which is an acid, is going to be way stronger because there's going to be more attraction between the pigment and the fibers. It is not so common to use soda ash and alum at the same time, but I found that for mushroom dyes, it's better. For scouring, we're using soda ash and dishwasher soap. And for more banting, we're using soda ash and alum. Any other questions? No, well, now let's go into the presentation. Let me change my video. We're gonna leave it there and I'm gonna share my screen. So we've measured our ingredients for scoring. 
We've measured our ingredients for more dancing once the fiber is clean. We already are letting the fibers to clean in the dye pot. So let's go with a the theory. Oh, there's another question in the chat. Two questions. What if you neglected to procure alum powder? Well, if we don't have alum powder, then we cannot more than the fibers mm, because we need the metallic salt to create the bond with the pigment. How long do we scar? We are going to scar for 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. Let me set the timer right here. And it also depends on the amount of fabric that you have. But since they are covered in wax from the machines that convert the thread into fabric, 20 minutes is perfect time. So the heat can remove these waxes along with the soda ash and the dishwasher soap. So I'm going to answer in text 20 to 30 minutes. Great. Any other questions? Well, if I see any other question, I'll stop and answer it. Now, let's start with the dye signs. Dye signs. First, we need to learn that there are different types of fibers. So not all fibers are going to absorb the dye in the same way. Main protein fibers are wool and silk. Wool from sheep, also from alpaca, even from llamas, from animals that have fur. And sadly, silk, well, yes, it's obtained from the cuckoos of the silk worm, which is Bombyx mori, the species of the moth. And in order to obtain the silk, they have to boil the cocoons with the larvae still inside. I do not use silk because I believe it's very cruel <laughs> to boil cocoons of, of moths, but it is very appreciated because it requires a huge amount of cocoons to have just one meter of silk. And the composition of silk is really thin, so it absorbs every color. Every color natural dye on silk is going to be way brighter than wool or even cotton. Here is a close-up, a micrography of the wool fibers. So wool is composed by protein. We have coarse wool on the first image, and that's the type of fiber that is on the outside of the fur of the sheep. The fine wool, these fibers are attached to the body, to the skin, they're closer to the, to the animal. We can observe alpaca wool, cashmere, and silk, as I mentioned, is really, really thin. It's like a straw, so it will soak up all of the color. The second image is a micrography of the surface of the protein fiber of wool. And the last image is a micrography of the keratin and the lanolin covering these fibers. So we need to remove these waxes if we want the fibers to absorb the dye. That's why we need to score to clean with the heat to make them dissolve in water. This is the structure of a merino wool fiber. As we can see, there are proteins nested inside another. So when we remove these, oh, let me get my pen. When we remove these parts, this waxy part, we are allowing all these proteins to absorb the natural dyes, the colors. Oh, there's another question in the chat. Ah. Don't we love proteins? Everything's made of protein. Cellulose fibers. Well, there are many, many, many cellulose fibers. We are using cotton today, which is the most common in the world. There's also lin linen that comes from flax, linen usita sin sinimum. <laughs> this is the coarse fiber before it's going to be converted into threads and eventually fabric. Hemp is really beautiful. Here is in the crude, in the raw state, in the natural color it has, sort of beige. And bamboo fibers are frequently bleached and treated to obtain this white color. Cotton also is bleached very frequently, but the, the raw color of bamboo and hemp, it's really, really beautiful. And it gives different hues when you use natural dyes because you don't have a white base, but, but a beige one. So it blends with the color beautifully. Tencel is trending. 
is a new fiber. It's manufactured by Lensing Fibers in Austria. And it's very similar to cotton. It comes from eucalyptus trees. They have sustainable forests in Austria that they grow with eucalyptus trees so they can transform in pulp and eventually in fibers. And this amazing thing is the lotus silk. This is the stem of the lotus flower. And this beautiful lady is obtaining a thread of silk that she's going to convert in fabric. She is Pan, Pan Tuan from Hanoi in Vietnam. And this place used to be a silk workshop, a worm silk workshop. Now she uses it to make these amazing shawls, all manufactured by hand from lotus silk. Very expensive, very expensive, but very beautiful. And it's better than boiling cocoons. Going back to the cellulose fiber of cotton, we can observe that just like wool, it has different walls nested of fabric of fibers within each other. So we also need here's a cuticle. We need to remove this cuticle using heat and the soda ash and the dishwasher soap to be able to arrive all of these inside fibers of the fiber. The core part of the cotton fiber is called the lumen. And here is the lumen where we find the fibrillis that are the huge chains of the cellulose molecule. Now, every two units of cellulose are called a cellulobius units and are composed by glucose monomer. Don't we love glucose as well? We love protein and glucose. <laughs> Everything is made of sugar and protein. Oh, Mary says, we have an abundance of recycled fibers, so is, it is a way to have a circular economy. Yes, actually, one of the fabrics that I'm using today is 100% recycled cotton. There's a company here in Merida, well, it's an hour drive. It's called Geotex, and they recover cotton from all over Mexico, and they create 100% blends of recycled cotton, and also 95% recycled cotton and 5% virgin cotton because well the fibers do not have the same strength when you recycle them and some brands some fashion brands require oops, um, more resistance resistant to tear of the fabric but of course the the best thing to do is to use recycled fibers because there are already a thousand billion garments in the world so we need to recover those materials and place them back into the loop of the circular economy thank you mary Okay, so going back to the cotton, we need to trespass all of these walls and arrive to these places. So the dye gets really, really deep into the fiber. These are three dyeing processes. However, the dyeing process, it's like magic. Uh, you can add one, two, three modifiers. You can have a frame more than, a more than, a post more than. You can change it depending on the needs you have, the resources available to you, and also the results that you are looking for. Ah, Mary, that's a great. Mary says that by recycling silk, you can have silk without boiling again the cocoons. That's, that's really good. Okay, so going back to the dyeing process. The first part is to clean the fiber that we are doing right now. Then we mold on the fiber. This is the basic three step. And then we dye the fiber and we're done. This is a sample of wood dyed with Chamete Sanguinea. Clean fiber, mold on it with alum and soda ash, and then I dyed it. That's it. However, I could also, well, we could also clean the fiber. Are they premorbans that are mostly tannic acids that you can't find? Oh, this is fun. Look at my writing with the computer. Oh. <laughs> Tannic acids that you can find in old girls, some type of eucalyptus, wood generally has tannic acids. Then you more than your fiber with alum or alum and soda ash. Then you dye your fiber and at the end add a modifier. Modifiers are usually copper 
sulfates or iron sulfates. So this sample right here is horseshoe mushroom that grows on trees. It's also a polypore like this. It looks like the, the, the shoe of a horse. And I did all of this process and at the end, this sample right here that has a turquoise color was modified with copper and the greener one whoops, was modified with iron sulfate. Another thing you can do is to clean the fiber. There's another process. Add a mordant A that will be stronger than a plain mordant. Add a mordant B, then dye the fiber and then modify it. And this sample is tramite sanguinea. Look at the changes from this bright orange yellow to this brown greenish deep color. What did I do? I cleaned my fibers, then I add the alum and the soda ash as a more than A. After that, I used a soy milk more than thin process. Once it was dried, I dyed the fiber with the tremendous sanguinea. And after that, I added a copper modifier. Now, it looks very different from the horseshoe mushroom because tremendous sanguinea might look yellow but eventually it, it is actually more orange than yellow so when you blend orange and green you get this kind of brownish green deep color oh we have questions in the chat let's see sam says also know that cotton farming is one of the highest pesticide users that is actually true yes i tend to cotton rot from birth Mm -hmm. and work with an organic farmer who grows an acre of organic cotton for me. So check your suppliers. Thank you so much, Sam. We'll do so. Heidi says, are these fibers, are these different processes used on different fibers or just different ways to dye? These are just different ways to dye. Cotton could be also more dented with soy milk. Mm, however, it does not add many, many properties as it does on wool because soy milk is protein. So when you add more protein to the wool fibers, you are creating a stronger bond. When you use soy milk with cotton is when you want to dye um, with earth pigments, with moth, dirt, those processes work better. Those processes work better, <laughs> the R's and the S, with soy milk on cotton. And there are also different ways to dye, to experiment with the same fabric, whether it's cotton or wool or recycled silk. Okay, so the mold hunting process. What is really great is that now we have chemicals, but a long time ago, there were no chemicals. So mankind, humanity, found very interesting ways to mold that and to clean the fibers. The most common mordants that you can obtain and buy from, from drugstores even are alum sulfates, iron sulfates, Potash alum, which is the one we are using today, it, come, it happens naturally, it's a natural mineral on earth. Tannic acid, as I said, from oak gals or some tree trunks that contain high amounts of tannic acid. Tartaric acid that can be found in the banana tree trunk. And plants like rhubarb that have a bioaccumulation from the soil into the leaves. You literally boil the leaves of rhubarb with your fabrics and you have a very good source of alum. So why do we need to more than our fibers? We need to more than them so we can create a chemical bond that will be like a bridge between the fibers and the dyes. We have a question in the chat. Comfrey, I do not know what comfrey is. If you it is another um, uh, bioaccumulator plant, so I can send you a link. Oh yes, please. If it accumulates um, iron or alum, it should work definitely. There are many many other plants used in Indonesia. I do not have the species list right now, but the most common one is rhubarb.
Oh, Mary is asking, I would like to die organically. I struggle to find organic ways of dying. Well, yes. And actually, at the end, we will, dis we will discuss the downside of natural dying, that is the usage of water. You need a lot of water to clean, to move on, to die. Um, the best organic ways to do it could be using only plant mordants, only plants to score the fabric as well. There are always ways to do it in a more natural and sustainable way. However, they take more time. If you are doing it as a hobby and if you have the time to do it, that's perfect and I encourage you to do it in a more organic way. Going back to the chemical bonds, this is really interesting because it's what the magic happens. Grab my pen again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are many types of bonds in chemistry, in organic chemistry in nature. Two of them are the ionic bonds and the covalent bonds. So the main difference is that ionic bonds is the, it, it happens between molecules with opposed silly charged ions. And the covalent bonds happens between atoms when elements within a molecule share an atomic orbital. So the electrons are together in the same orbital. That's why protein fibers have more color because the covalent bonds allows the electrons on the molecule of the dye and the molecule of the morvant to create a bond that is going to be stronger than when molecules are going to be attracted. I mean, molecule with molecule and in the covalent bonds are atoms holding each other. And that's the difference. That way cellulose fibers do not take so much color as protein fibers. This is a cellulose molecule. We have oxygen, hydrogen, this hydroxyl groups. When we add the alum, we are creating one thing that is called the coordination complex. And basically is that alum molecule is going to work as an anthem, grabbing has a magnet, anthem, magnet, grabbing all of the dye particles and creating these electronic bonds of attraction with the molecule of the dye. This is another example, flavonoid, luthiolin, which is um, the pigments that give us bright yellow colors on fabrics. It's creating, and this is creating a double coordinate complex because we have the cotton surface right here, the cellulose molecules, and if you have tannic acid of banana, you have one complex system, and then you add another coordination bonding, which is the alum, so you have more attraction here with the dye molecule. You are creating bridges between the fiber and the dye to eh, grab it and secure it into the fibers. This is another example of the formation of a complex. When alum is at the center and it's magnetizing and attracting all of the molecules from the dye stuff. So, what will determine a successful dye? The chemical structure of the dye and the chemical structure of the fabric molecules and the interaction between them. So more than what they do is to interact, is to increase, sorry, this interaction, creating a chemical bridge between the dye and the fabric. Types of dyes. There are different types of dyes ones that can be used without more than tin, but when you use a more than will be bright colors, ones that happen through oxidation processes, and the ones that need, always need a more than. So the first type of dyes are substantive dyes. This is Murex trunculus, and it's a snail that it's on the verge of extinction. It was extracted thousands of years ago, to obtain this purple color right here. The, the funny thing about this nail is that, unlike indigo, it starts yellow, um, blue, sorry, and when it oxidates with air, it turns purple. So Murex trunculus and Murex brandalis, brandalis snails, were used to create the famous Tyrian purple that is named after the ancient Phoenician city of Tyre, and it was produced about 16, 100 BC ago, and until the fall of Constantinople 
1453. So for many, many years, these poor snails were extracted and squeezed to obtain the color. The body of the snail needs to be fully squeezed to obtain this bright, bright blue that will turn into a purple. Oh, let me erase that. There we go. Now, this is the indigo, which is another type of dye. You does not need to more than you create your batch of indigo, you soak your fibers. You wait for the oxidation process, and then you have this beautiful, beautiful blue. It's widely used in Japan. Oh, so I'll, I will end explaining the indigo, and then we have to go and check on the fibers. So indigo does not need a more than, you do not need more than cotton even to obtain deep blues of the indigo dye. This is the indigo plant, so fruticaria. Is the variety we have here in Mexico. Pintoria is the variety you have in India and other places of the world, but mostly in India. So this is in the Gofera Sufruticosa, the one you can find in Mexico. This is cochineal, but before we talk about cochineal, I'm gonna go check on my dipot and you should do the same. Let me change cameras. There we go and stop sharing screen. There we are. So what are we going to do now? Oh, let's go. And what, yes, thank you, Mary. What is another type of sustantive dye that does not need a more? If you see the water, it turned slightly yellow because it's extracting it's the wax and the dust from the fibers. Now my fibers look a little pink because even though I really scratch my pot, some dyes are really, really strong. Now, go get a bucket of a plastic container so we can take out the, the fabrics and start the more than tin process. Remember to use your rubber gloves. I can never find rubber gloves my size. My hands are too tiny, so it almost look like this. However, they are really, really useful. Approach the pocket of the base, the pot. Go and squeeze your fibers. They are going to be really, really hot. Please be careful. Turn off your heat source. And now, rinse your fibers briefly with clean, fresh water. I'm going to write them and go back. Okay, here are my three fibers. I recommend to have a bucket so the water will not go to the drain. You can pour it into the bucket. Wait for it to cool and use it in the garden. I'm going to grab more water because we are going to start the more dancing process right now.
here I am again. Now, before you turn on the heat again, in the same pockets or plastic container where you are mixing your fibers for most of your water, leave just a tiny amount of water in your pot. Why? You're going to see what happens when you mix an acid and an alkali together, which is the case of the alum and the sodium carbonate. What will happen is that bubbles are going to emerge and the solution is going to increase the volume. So first, we're going to add the soda ash. Remember to dissolve everything in your dye pots. You can turn on the heat right now. Now we're going to add the alum. Now the water is not hot, so you might not see many bubbles coming out. But let's find out what happens. This is cold. It will start to bubble a little bit. As the alum dissolves, there we go. Now, these bubbles are a reaction when you mix an alkali, an alkali, sorry, and an acid. It's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's not bubbling. The fumes of the bubbles are not toxic, they are not poisonous. As you can see, there are the bubbles. So mix to make sure that all of that air goes out before we add the fibers. And now place the heat in medium low so it can see. It should not be very hot because if it boils, well, it's going to be a mess. Now you can add your fibers. This is the one that is 100% recycled cotton. Cotton, fibers, and add the rest of the water. Make sure they can move really happy where they are. Great. This process can take from 30 minutes to one hour. We are going to do it for minutes as well because, well, we have little time. So I'm going to set my timer. 20 minutes works fine. You can even give a bat to the fabric, to the fabric again after you make the dye. There we go. So, if you notice that the color is not as bright as you want after you dye the fibers, you have to save this water because you can add the fibers again to the solution and the color will increase. Let's see the questions in the chat. If you want heat resistant gloves, you can punch it at the cheese making. Ah, that is a great advice, Sam. I never thought of it. I'll see if I can find some cheese making suppliers in Yucatan because there is not so much of a cheese industry here, perhaps in Chiapas, in Jalisco, many cheese from Jalisco. Thank you, Sam. I'm going to share my screen again. Oh, wood and indigo. Wood is really beautiful. Can you see everything all right? 
I'm gonna see you all. Angel, is the presentation running good? Yes. Okay. So let's continue. As I said before, substantive guides do not need more than two. Actually, I think we're seeing your presenter. You. View. Ah, okay. This card sharing. Can you see it now? Or are yeah. you seeing it? Great. Perfect. There's a trick in these PowerPoint things. So we've talked about the Murex Trunculus snail of the Pyran Purple, about the indigo used in fabrics, the plant of the indigo, Indigo Picosta, which is the one that grows here in Mexico. Cochineal is also a substantive dye. You can use it with other mordants and it will soak up in the fiber. However, brighter reds and pinks are going to come if you more than your fiber. Now, this is amazing, and I like to show it every time I talk about dyes. Dyes are not only used in fabrics, they can also use them, be used in painting. This is a codex, a page of the Codex Sushenutal from a long, long time ago, from the 12,000 period of the Mistec um, civilization in Oaxaca. And it is painted on deer skin. We can see the green color and the green is obtained from mixing indigo and marigold. And all of the reds are obtained, even this um, deep red, black kind of color, were obtained with cochineal. It's so antique and it remains. That's the power of, of some of the natural dyes, of the substantive dyes like cochineal and indigo that we can see in codex from many, many years ago. This codex is now on the British Museum. Um, this is cochineal, many hues and shades of cochineal that you achieve when you modify the pH using um, sodium, by, sodium bicarbonate or using vinegar. When you alter the pH, the colors, the range of color changes in the cochineal. And this is wool, a tapestry in Oaxaca. And also, well, I'm in the, in the Mayan place of Yucatan. These ruins are in Bonampak, Chiapas. And this turquoise of the ruin is called the Mayan blue. And it was achieved by mixing indigo powder and bentonite clay in heat. So they had um, mod bases where they mixed the powder of the indigo and the bentonite clay. So indigo will liquefy and penetrate the clay. So when this was applied on a wall, it will give that turquoise light blue effect. Very, very beautiful color. Oh, you have cochineal, Mary. That's amazing. Cochineal is really, really good dye and for pigments and for makeup. I don't use it for makeup, but many people do. It's a really, really good dye. Now, there are other types of dyes, but, and bad dye means, well, to use a bat, to use a bucket to create a dye. Of course, indigo, depending on the name of the, of the number of dips that you give to your fabric on indigo, it will acquire more, more, more active color. And this is the famous flower indigo of the dye bath. It is created when you stir it very strongly because you have to promote a fermentation and the movement of the bacteria that will ferment and break down the indigo molecule to make it available for the dye. And finally, well, more than dyes. There are all the rest and flowers, many plants are in this category. These are marigold dyed samples from botanical colors. And we can see that wool, linen, and cotton soak up the color really good. Let's see this chat, what do we have? Here. Oh, thank you, Angel. I will see that in a moment. Now, let me take a sip of water. Let's go back. Mushroom dice. Mushroom dice. Okay. So, what's with the mushrooms? Oh, let me see. 
there is also a salt for me you can use with wood yes thank you mary also you can use fresh indigo or wood leaves with salt um, some people use only cold water other people use even ice cubes it works better with silk it could also be used with cotton and with wool and basically what you do is that you crush the fresh indigo leaves with the salt and into the fabric you make some sort of guacamole <laughs> dyed blue guacamole and just crush 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 and you obtain a beautiful turquoise as well greenish turquoise from the water and the indigo leaves thank you mary now this is my mushroom um got forage from last year in jalisco we have uh, lactarius indigo bolexis species clavina romaria and mushroom dyes well are pretty amazing um let me grab my pen again these samples are obtained with Trametis sanguinea and the purples are from Ipomyces lactiflorum, also called the mushroom, the lobster mushroom. These samples are from Trametis sanguinea as well and horseshoe mushroom. These ones are from, it's not a mushroom, it's a bacteria that grows on trees, it's called Fomitopsis. And these ones are also Trametis blended with iron and copper to create that brown brownish color i have the samples here so i will show them in a while and these ones are the other ones that i showed you before mixing copper well adding copper has a modifier at the end of the dye bath to horseshoe mushroom mushroom dyes bind better with protein fibers because mushrooms are mostly protein. However, some species could also be used with cotton, like tomato sanguinea. When we talk about mushroom dyes, we have to mention Miriam C. Rice, and she was the first to start experimenting with mushrooms. Um, she studied as sculptor at the Arts Student League in New York, and after that she became a professor in the University of Rochester, but she also enjoyed teaching little children. So one day she was teaching a natural diet workshop at the Mendocino Art Center in California. And she bumped into a clump of these beautiful bright yellow mushrooms, Hippoloma fasciculare. And she decided to grab the mushrooms, toss it in the, the dye pot and see what happens. Luckily, a bright yellow color emerged from the mushrooms. So she decided to continue exploring mushroom dyes. She was using wool at the time, wool fibers. Here she is holding the rainbow of mushrooms. So she began studying many mushroom species. We know California is rich in mushroom biodiversity. And in 1974, with fresh publications in Santa Rosa, California, she published the first book on mushroom diets. Let's try mushrooms from color. It was basic showing you the colors and the species that you can use to achieve those colors. This is continent sanguineus, this is species of Oletis. And after that, six years later, in 1980, by Mad River Press, she published this amazing book that I cannot purchase because there was, there was a, a fire where they had these books and they are all gone for now. Um, but this book is Mushrooms for Color, and we can see the amazing rainbow. Basically, all of the colors can be found in mushrooms, even the blues that are the most typical ones to achieve in, in natural dyes. And it was published in 1980. The last book, and this book is available at a website that I'll share in the chat right now because you can purchase this one, the mushrooms from dyes, paper, and pigments, and microsticks. It was published in August in 2001. And the work that Miriam did here is amazing because she does not only propose mushrooms to dye fabric, but also polypore species to create paper from the fibers of chitin, how to extract the pigments from the mushrooms to make microsticks or crayons. Beeswax crayons 
using pigments extracted from mushrooms. She passed in 2010, and these are all the samples of all the colors you can achieve. These shades of red are obtained using cortinaria sanguineus. The yellows and the greens are uh, obtained using phylogenitsi, and the purples are mostly obtained from lichen species. So every time you talk about mushroom dyes, you have to talk about Miriam Searles, the amazing work she did. These are extracted from the book um, Mushrooms for Dyes, Papers, and Microsticks. She did drawings of the mushroom species, some ink tests with different colors. She also used modifiers to see how the color changed. And it's just a tremendous work that reflects the love she had for dyes and mushrooms. Um, in, in 1985, Miriam C. Rice and her friends Carla and Eric Sundstrom from Sweden, they founded together the International Mushroom Dye Institute. What happened is that they were friends of Miriam since forever. And when they started to learn about the mushroom dyes, they decided to make a book about it in Sweden and they published it and it translates to create from mushroom dyes. So they created together the International Mushroom Dye Institute in the US. And of course, years later, the International Fungi and Fiber Symposium was born. We have the organizers here. She's Alisa Allen. Her project is called Mycopigments. Google it that way. She's amazing, amazing mycodia. This is Tess Barlow, Julie Beeler, amazing sweet Julie, also a master crafter of the micro dyes. Um, she is Kristin Mohana, Monahan and Anna Miris. They are the organizers of the International Fungi Fiber Symposium, and it's going to happen this October in 4000, Washington, in the US. These are Cortinaria semi sanguineus because you can see the stem is yellow instead of red. So that's the only the main difference between Cortinaria sanguineus and Cortinaria semi sanguineus. And of course, the amount of pigment is less in this, in this variety. And well, beautiful rainbow of mushroom dyes. We have a Cortinaria sanguineus here. Yellow from Phylushonitsi, purples from lichen dyes, greens from Phylushonitsi modified with iron sulfate, and also oranges and turquoise from Hidmelium kyrelum that we're going to see in a while as well. All of these mushroom dyes. Amazing. So if you are becoming a mushroom dye obsessed person like myself, you should purchase this book. It's called The Rainbow Beneath My Feet. Authors are Arlene and Alan Besset. And what is good, it does not necessarily tell you how to die. It does at the beginning, but it does not go into indications for every species. However, let me show you. It is very complete because it's a field guide to identify mushrooms that will give you color. This mushroom is the Pomisus lactiflorum, the lobster mushroom. I'll show you in a while. We have a chat. Hey, Heidi, I'm so glad you have it. I definitely love it. Love it, love it, love it. For those who don't have it, you can see, let me go all the way back. So it's really, really complete. It's a full field guide. You grab your book, you go into the forest, you identify the mushrooms, and then you go back to this part of the index where it tells you how to use, how to make the dye of that species. And it also says the page where you can find the illustration of that species. So if you wanna go mushroom dyeing, here's the Hydnellium carellium that I said before for the blue pigment. Get this book, it's really amazing. And it's so relaxing to see all these beautiful mushroom photos. Also, as I mentioned, Julie Diller, she's amazing, amazing, amazing. And all the work she did the past years, 
She has documented it in what's called the Mushroom Color Atlas. You Google Mushroom Color Atlas, and it's a web page where you can find all of these colors. So if you go and you click on any of these mushrooms, it will tell you the colors that you can obtain in paper and in fabric with modifiers of iron sulfate and copper sulfate. So this is a tiny extract of the mushroom color atlas. atlas. And first, pyrochonitsi or bias polypore, we can obtain these beautiful, beautiful greens, oranges, and yellows on fabric, these ones, more brownish colors are obtained in pigment preparation that you can use for paper. And this is the pyrochonitsi. Hypomyces lactiflorum can give you these pink orange shades, bright and beautiful as well. This is the famous lobster mushroom. Now, Hypomyces lactiflorum is not the mushroom body itself but it's a parasitic fungus that invades Lactarius species. So what we are actually seeing is a Lactarius, it could be a Lactarius deliciosa, a Lactarius indigo even, that has been invaded by the Hypomyces lactiflorum, turning it into this orange crusty color in appearance. Oh, thank you, Angel. These colors purples, bright reds, sort of pink, orange, reds as well, are obtained from Cortinaria sanguinus, Cortinaria sanguinus. And the pigments, as you can see, they even resemble the pigments of the cochineal. Very, very deep colors from Cortinaria sanguinus. And these are these beautiful mushrooms. You can see the red pigments all over the stem, the cap, all over the bodies. Let me erase this. There we go. Now, blues are always hard to find in nature. However, the Hydnellum caerellum mushroom, uh, or blue tooth mushroom, that also looks, it's, it's very, very easy to identify because of the appearance and bright blue color, can yield this beautiful green, blue, turquoise colors on fabric. And on the pigment using the entire mushroom, you can achieve these colors. I, I love this mushroom too. It's so, so beautiful. Here it is, Hypnalium caralum, the blue tooth fungus. It has tooths instead of gills or spores. And it's just so, so blue and beautiful. It also um, performs the phenomenon of mutation. It sweats little drops of blue pigment, and it's and it's really really beautiful, really beautiful. And it gives. Let's go again to this, to the shades. My annotations, very beautiful. So, where can I find mushrooms? How can I know if I have this book? And I'm interested. For instance, at the end of the book, you can find a list of colors. It is grays, greens, and blacks. So I want to have a green and I identify the species on the list. Then you can go to iNaturalist. Oh. Okay, so we have 20 minutes. Let's give 10 minutes more to obtain this of the more than process. But come with me. I will stop sharing. Can I push share? And no, I will stop sharing. There we go. And I'll go to the dye pots. Here we are. So I can see that we are a little tight in time. Let's rinse our fabrics. So we're going to perform the same process again. Turning on the heat source. Put on your rubber gloves. Those who are doing it at the same time with me, remember to wear your gloves. Take our fibers out of this bag. It's going to be really hot. It's 
system like noodles. Now, before we rinse the fibers, remember this water, you can save it for later use. Pour it into a bucket. Now we have the heat off. Rinse your pot and add more water because we're going to prepare the dye back from now in order to extract the color. Here I am again. Place your pot on the heaters. Turn all the heats. And before we rinse our fiber, we have it right here. Wait a second. Let's grab the mushroom. So I want to show you the pores. This is my beautiful mushroom, Chamele Sanguinea. We have the pot right here. Let me focus. I don't know if you can see. Oh, wait. I can adjust this right here. There we go. Look at all those pores. Now, it is funny because the spore print of this mushroom is actually white. So all the pigments are in the fruiting body. Now, close this. And here we go. Oh no, let me adjust the box again. There we go. So it is not necessary, it is not necessary to grind it or convert it into dust. Just chop, 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 rip, 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 and add it to the dye pot. If you are using marigold, add your marigold flowers whole or the petals here. Look at the bright, bright orange. Add the mushroom. Look at my hands. Wow. Heidi asks if there is just water in the pot. Just water, nothing else. All of the things we want to create the bonds are already on the fabrics. We'll add this piece. Look at my hands. And also the ones I have in this beautiful branch. I'm going to go to the dye Now, this mushroom is amazing because you can have even four or five um, rounds, let's say, of dye, and it will give color every time. It will diminish, of course. Look at that. But you will have color always. So now it looks like I ate a whole bag of Cheetos.
Make sure. So, as you can see, very slightly there's a, green, a yellow color coming out of the mushroom. Set it in high heat, very important high heat. And let's just leave it there. Now, put on your rubber gloves again and rinse your fabric. We are not going to place the, fa the fabric in the pots. We are just extracting the dye for now. Remember, we have to fold it first. Rinse it, rinse it, rinse it, rinse it. And squeeze. Squeeze it. Put it aside. There we go. Let's go back. We can hurry up because I've noticed that time is almost up. Just water. We have only water. If you are using anato seeds, um, place the anato seeds and have 50% uh, of bicarbonate of sodium bicarbonate into the dye pot in order to extract the dye because the uh, carotenoids of anato are not readily available for dye. You have to extract them. Yeah. Ready? Okay. So going back, you go to, you identify the species that you want to find, go into inaturalist.org, and then on the search bar, you type the species, you choose map view, and da -da -da -da, there we go. See how widely spread traumatic species is, even in islands, even in the islands. And you can choose each observation and see if it's near your location. So very briefly, why are we doing all of this? Why do we care about natural dyes? <laughs> if we have such bright, beautiful Hawaiian shirts. Well, very briefly, I'm gonna tell you about the impact of synthetic dyes. This molecule is an azo dye and it's called the red, red 120. And as you can see, it's very, very big. This molecule is very big and it has a molecular weight greater than a natural dye molecule. So ASO dyes and many other synthetic dyes have been linked to the creation of carcinogenic, carcinogenic aromatic amines. These are linked to bladder and liver cancers in humans. They can reduce growth, produce neurosensory damage and metabolic stress in fish species, and they can even inhibit plant growth. Sadly, 80% of the pollution of the water comes from the textile industry. This is an aromatic ring, and these are the things that we find in these ASO dyes. Now, why are these things important? Look at the ring. Well, because the shape of the dyes resembles the shape of the hormones, human hormones and blood hormones, because all of them have these aromatic compounds. So in plants, they can alter growth alter flowering and even impair photosynthesis because they are imitating the function of the hormones that the plant has, but they do not perform the function because it is not actually the hormone itself that the plant is absorbing. So I'll leave you two minutes to read this. These are extracts from a paper analyzing health damages, of synthetic dyes. Yes, they can even intercalate in our DNA. Yes, they can even go deep down into our nervous central system. So it is very concerning and it is very, very horrible 
the damage that synthesized can do. Also, ecosystems, people that live in these places. This is Wobao, a dying industry zone in China. Well, they are constantly exposed to these chemicals, so they develop early age cancers that can lead, lead of course, to death. We got mushrooms locally, so it has been proving, it, it has pro been proved that most of the lignolytic basidomycetes have the capability of breaking down these components and remediating water and also the soil, thanks to the lignolytic peroxidizers that they have. Breaking down wood, and they can break also these components. So we already clean our fibers, we more than total fibers. Our dipod is getting ready. Now let's fold. We already rinse, we already more than it. And before we fold, let's go very briefly into the shibori technique so we can learn all the processes of folding and its magic. Angel, can we take 10 or 15 minutes more than yeah. we have scheduled? Yes? Oh, great. Yes. Perfect. If anybody has to go, I believe the recording is going to be available. So if you have to go, you can go and then check on the recording. Shibori. These are, this is an exhibit at the Tokyo Kyoto Museum of Shibori. We can see that it's using indigo, this bright blue. So history. There are not so many records about the Shibori technique when it was precisely born, sort of speak. Some say it came from China, some say it's exclusively from Japan but we don't know the precise truth. It comes from the verb shiboru, which means to ring, squeeze, or press. And the oldest, oldest record is this painting in which we can observe these fabrics hanging in a workshop. And the patterns are shibori, shibori fabrics. And also we can find shibori fabrics in here. This painting is from the um, Nara period, from 758, 680. Now, shibori is a technique of resist dyeing. That means you isolate parts of the fabric to avoid dyeing. Like batik in Indonesia, where they use wax to avoid dye in some parts of the fabric. This is a painting, a painting from 1845, made by artist Utagawa Kunisada, and is a woman making shibori. There are three types of shibori. There are types of shibori and also categories. So the types depend on the thread type and mostly on the thread thickness. Nyura shibori is, uses medium fine cotton thread. Boshi shibori uses medium cotton thread. And kumo shibori uses a heavy lining thread. Now it will also depend on the weight of the fabric that we are using. Mm. If you are using trametis, you will start to feel the smell of the, of the mushroom soup. It's powerful, but it's, it's, it's really good. So techniques, there are hundreds and hundreds of techniques because the name of the technique will be determined by the shape of the drawing. So there are six main techniques in shibori dyeing. The first one is harashi, where you use a pole or even a, a, a piece of wood, a branch, like the ones I have in here. Well, I will show it like the ones I have in here. And using cotton thread, you tie your fabric and knot it. You can create these amazing patterns using, using harashi shibori. This is a PVC tube, and I don't like to use PVC because it's, um, polychloride of vinyl and it's called, it's known as the cancer plastic. So I don't use this on my dipoles. I prefer wood, always prefer wood. Itajime is the technique that we're using today. Itajime shibori is basically folding and pressing. You can use wooden blocks, blocks or these thumb presses like the one we have. And if the wooden blocks are carved with motifs, it's called Kyokechi. This pattern was created with carved wooden blocks of lines. 
that isolate the parts of the fabric. And these motifs well, are way more um, complex, intricate. And here we can see a press with the fiber, with the fabric, and each of these, well, we can see it here, but it's here, and each of these wooden blocks. This then is soaked into the indigo box. Right? So, harashi for wrapping, itajime, folding, and using blocks of wood. Kanoko shibori is another technique in which you tie, it's, it's really, um, it takes a lot of time to do it. You tie the cloth into small pinches, and each of, the, in each of these pinches is not individually by hand. Oh, oh, what's going on? Where is it? Uh, 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 wait. Hmm. Where is the image in here? Ah, wait. It's, it's a video, and I want to show it. We're doing where things go. Here it is. Shibori. Okay, so Harashi, Itajime, Yokechi, and Kanoko and Nyura are similar because here is the big deal. Well, this is Nyura Shibori. The Nyura Shibori is said to be a technique from a woman named Miura, who had arrived from Kyushu's Bungo province, today's Oita prefecture. From the many people drawn in ukiyo-e wearing clothing with the Miura Shibori pattern, it is obvious that it was a very popular technique back then. A ring is made with damp thread. The left index finger is pushed under the fabric. Finally, the thread is tightened. In Hari Hitashibori, the fabric is placed over the needle before binding, but in Miura Shibori, the ring is first made and then hooked and bound. There are Hitta Miura Shibori, which is bound accordingly to the design and Yatara Miura Shibori, which does not need a design to follow. Now, I have here, let me just check very briefly, the images of the other Shibori techniques. Here they are. Which is this eye. Here I have it. So you can see the Kanoko, and the wait, and the kumo, which is called the spider die. Kumo, kumo shibori is what we know as the tie die. It's more a random way of tying the fabric. And here it is. So this is kanoko, kanoko shibori, where you tie the clothes in small pinches and you obtain these results very elaborate, and Kumo All right. This is the Kumo. You can see that they look like tiny spider legs. You strap one part of the fabric and tie the knot, creating this sort of anten or spider leg. And these are the patterns that you can have. We've seen the, the video of Miura Shibori. Oh, was I sharing the screen? I was, I, I am sharing my screen, yes, sorry. So let me phrase this into the presentation again. Mm -hmm. There we are. That's the kumu, Miura. Now, the other technique is called nui shibori, and it's also known as teaching shibori. You're not screen sharing, I don't know if I'm you're screen sharing? To. No. Oh my God. Ah, so you did not see the Miura? The dot one? We saw the dot one, but I haven't seen anything since then. Okay. Now, now we can see it. 
Great. Thank you, Mary. This is the Kumo. This is the spider that look like tiny spider legs. Kumo Shibori. We've seen the video of Miura and the stitch Shibori. It's called Nui Shibori in Japanese, but it's quietly known as the stitch Shibori. And one of the main artists in stitch Shibori is Katharine Ellis. We can see natural dyes or fiber reactive dye. Any dye process may be used to color the fibers, immersion dyeing or direct application. Natural dyes or fiber reactive dye. Any dye process may be used to color the fibers, immersion dyeing or direct application. When the dyeing is completed, then the gathering threads may be carefully cut out and removed. This piece has been dyed in indigo. I will cut the small knots on one end and then pull the threads out, revealing the truly remarkable pattern in the cloth. The scarf is ready to wash. There you can see. It's very amazing the results you can have with stitch shivery, and it's also very elaborate. So if you have become shivery obsessed like me, I encourage you to go and visit the Kyoto Shibori Museum the International Shibori Symposium that happens in Tokyo. I believe this year is going to be, after two years of pandemic, they're finally going to have another edition of the International Shibori Symposium. And you can also join and see what's going on in the World Shibori Network. If you want to continue your education and training in Shibori techniques, these are free DVDs by, uh, by Annalisa Edstrom, one of the greatest artists in Shibori techniques. She does a lot of exploration using all of the techniques, Kumo, no Miura, Shibori even. And you can purchase them at slowfiberstudios.com. So we are going to do Itajime Shibori. I'll try to make some of these samples. I have my poles right here to make some harashi and my wooden blocks right there to try some kyokichi shibori. But I will also use the marbles. I did not bring rocks, but if you have rocks, you can use them. Clothes, pins, rubber bands, and etc. So I have here, ah, slide. let me share the screen. I'll leave, hmm, let me see if I can, do a little trick here. Mm -hmm. Because here we have, here it is. Now. These are the techniques that we're going to do. If you have the club spins, the thumb, the presses, I'm going to do the harashi shibori, and your rubber bands, we are going to create some of these shapes. So now I will stop sharing, change my camera, and go. There is our beautiful mushroom soap. You can see some color. Whoa, the color dip. I want to show you the color of the water. There we go. If you are using a shiote or an aposit, you will have a brighter orange color. Here. So what are we going to do now? I'll move my pot. So you can all see my hands while I am folding the fabric. Right here, these are rubber bands. 
The folding techniques. Some people think it's very obvious, but it is not that obvious to adjust the shiver. We are going to place our fabric on the table. Okay. And there we go. And I'm going to cut this in half. So I can make different folding techniques. Shivery works good with rectangle fabrics, but you can also cut them in square fabrics, in square shapes, to create concentric rings. Here we have fabrics, one and a half. And also fold it in half and cut it. My fingers are still orange, and if I rub them, they leave, they stain the fabric with yellow. So first, we're going to do the most common one, which is a triangle. Here, so place your fabric this way. Oh, the auto zoom. There we go. Here we are. Place your fabric this way, fold it in half, and then we are going to create triangles by taking this corner into this side. We have a triangle now. Many people believe that you have to do this, but you have to go and flip your fabric here, behind. Then you flip it again, in front. Then you flip it again, behind. And you continue doing so until all of your fabric is Ready. Okay. Now we have our triangle. What can we do? If we want to do Kyokechi Shibori, we have to use some wooden blocks, like this ones. But we can also use the thumb pressers available at the drugstore and create many patterns. So you can place one this way and other one this way. Just one in the middle, one crossing the triangle, or a few ones doing this. Really, it's up to you. Anything that you want to create. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go with the center option. So you place one of your thumb depressors on the top and the other one on the back. You press, make sure your fabric does not unfold. So let's change it this way. You can also place it on one edge of the fabric. Remember, it will all replicate, so you will have very cool intricate patterns at the end. We're going to grab our rubber bands and secure 
the counter presses at the end because that pressure is going to prevent the dye to penetrate the fabric. So let's press it this way. And secure it. Oops. And grab another rubber band. There we go. You can use many rubber bands to make sure that there will be enough pressure and avoid the fabric to absorb the dye. Very, 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 very tight. There we go. Now let's go to the other side. Mm -hmm. Oops. Again. Now the ones are better. There we go. Press, press, press. So now you can put it in the die pot. I'll turn my camera to get no food. Can you see the color coming out? It's, it's very bright here, but you can see how it is starting to change the color. Very slight. So I'll place it in my dye pot, and now I'll come back with my other packets. Now, if you have cloth spins, we can make a very simple square pattern. Place your fabric, you again fold it in half and then you take one half up to this edge, then you flip it around and take the other edge to the previous one. You fold your fabric in half. You can fold your fabric again in half. You have a beautiful squishy squishy. Or you can also do the on the opposite side. And the opposite side. And now you place your clothes pins. This will create dots and give an effect of a pattern in the places that the dye will not be absorbed. Again, I recommend to use some rubber bands. Make sure that, oh, you know what? This one is <laughs> working. I'm going to use this other one. It's my cloth pins are a little bit weak. There we go. We place it in the die pot. And you can see here the effect is greater of the color. And you see the color? And it's a little bit bright. Oh, I hope you can see. Closer, there it is. We are already having a beautiful yellow color. We place it in the dye pot. Now, if we want to create the effect of concentric circles, we can use our marbles. And we will also need our rubber bands. Fold the fabric in half. We always have to fold it in half. And we are going to create the pattern. So 
you can create circles in two ways using the marbles you place a marble and then you place a rubber band oh the other focus there you are there we are there i am there you are so you place the marble and then you uh, notch it with a rubber band or with cotton fabric and you will have a circle you can create another place another rubber band in here or you can avoid the use of marbles and give it a fold this way like a pole if you do not have an actual wooden pole you can do this and place rubber bands like this i think right something i think there's a function to to change that give me a second Mm -hmm. Let me see. Now we did not change that much. But you can place a rubber band right there. Or you can knot it with your cotton thread without the need of using a pole. You can do this. Da, 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 da. See? And if you tighten it really strong, in these places, there won't be room for the die to go. Now, I want to venture myself and do the Harashi Shibori. So I will extend my fibers. You have, if you're, if you can do this later, you have to pull the fabric while you are rolling it. So it can be really, really tight, but avoid any wrinkles that might be room for the bike to go. So we have this, and if we want to do the harashi shibori, we have to tie the rubber thread, make a tiny knot at the beginning, and continue tightening. Now, the magic of harashi is that once you tighten it, you can swirl it to create a different effect. Or you can also go again, creating different lines, crossing sections of the knots. It should be tight, 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 and tighter. Time, time, time. Then we make a knot. Right. Knot. Right there. And I'll try to see if I can fill it somehow. Now it's really tight. So let's play this harashi in the die cut. And I'm going to do another one using the thumb the presses. Okay. So we're going to do the square, which is another classic folding technique. You fold your fabric in half. And then you begin to fold a little square up. But again, you don't go this way. You flip it around and you go on the back. Then you flip it back to the front. Then you flip it back to the back. Once you finish. And now, you see the thumb of presses, or see what I have here. I have another stronger pinch. I'm going to fold it even more and see what crazy pattern I can create using these wooden blocks.
here. On the other side, I will secure it. Now, if you don't have the cloth space, if you don't have a plan, and if you don't have the wooden blocks, blocks, you can simply grab your rubber bands and place them here. Oops. Oh, my rubber bands are not so good. And tie them up right there. Place it and tie another knot right here with your rubber bands. The tighter, the better, because you will make really, really sure that there no pigment goes in there. And now, instead of my wooden blocks, I can use my thunder presses this way. Mm -hmm. I can use them double even to increase the pressure and secure them with rubber bands. And one, two, three turns, great. And on the other side. One, two, see the rubber band resist. Yay! Three turns, okay? So we have a fabric sandwich. And we'll put it in the light box. Now, this is right here. And go back with you. How else do you see what's on that in the side part? There they are. You can see there's a beautiful yellow color happening there. Leave it in high heat. So, let's go here. Let's go to the final part of the presentation. Share my screen with you. There we are. So we've, we've covered dye science, motion dyes, and the shibori technique. And now we're going to learn an overview of the species we're using, Clamex sanguinea. Um, briefly about the ethnomycology. We have an amazing ethnomycologist here, Mariana Villani. I hope you can nurture us um, at the end, telling us your experience with the research of this, of this mushroom. Mariana, she literally lives in the jungle of Brazil. And she's really sweet, so I'm sure she will have something to, to say. And well, we'll learn very briefly the pigment synthesis. How is this amazing pigment created in the mushroom? And if we can clone it. So, an overview of the species. There's always confusion with the name. Is it Trometis? Is it Pignoporus? Well, Pignoporus was the first given name to the species because it means with compact and dense spores. However, in recent years, after, after doing DNA analysis to the species, it has been proven that it belongs to the Trametis group with Trametis versus color, etc. It shares DNA with that species. So it is a basidomycetes, meaning that it creates a protein body. It is a saprophytic fungi, meaning uh, that it fits on the K word, it decomposes lightning and cellulose of hardwood trees like mangoes and many other tropical species. 
and it's widely spread across warm climates, both humid and dry. I can find this mushroom in Jalisco that is very dry, and here in Merida, that is um, the humidity percentage, it's about 19, 100%. So it grows on dry and wet climates. Every time they have to be, they, they must be warm, warm, wet, or dry. So the domain is eukaryota, this is the classification of the fungi, kingdom fungi, abacidomycetes, meaning that it has a protein body. It belongs to the class of the agaromycetes, the order of the polypores, the family polyporacea, genus Trametes, and the species sanguine, specifically this beautiful bright orange. So there's a theory that saprophytic fungi played a, a very important role in the evolution and diversification of invertebrates because it made available a great source of, um, of food for many other small fishes like beetles and worms that feed on the cave food. So silophagus, uh, insects, meaning insects that feed on wood, need phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium, among other elements. And that's what the mushroom is doing. He's decomposing the wood and making it available for them to nurture themselves. This is Chalcophora mariana, ah, a pine eating beetle, very, very common here in Mexico. And he's so cute. He's really, really cute. So mushrooms are more important than we might think because they also play an important role in the diversification of invertebrates. There are many varieties, well, not so many, many, but three varieties of the Pignoporus or Trometis species. The one we're using in this photo I took myself from a place near my house is Pignoporus sanguineus. It is more yellow, pores are widely dispersed and are not so small as in other species or the varieties. And it has a large foot. The foot of the, I'm not using my pen, the foot. It's large, it's not so, so tightly attached to the, to the branch. Pignoporus cinnabarius, it's a little different. We can observe that it's even shiny, slightly shiny. The fruit and body looks a little bit boxy and it goes to a reddish hue instead of a yellowish hue. And Pignoporus coccinius, that is mostly found in, there we go, in India and Australia, all the Indian and Pacific Oceans. This is the most common species of varieties of Pignoporus in Australia. So again, we can see that this mushroom is everywhere, even in islands, very widely distributed. Now, very briefly, the ethnomycology. It is very interesting to see all of the uses that this amazing mushroom has. And in Mexico, well, Totonacos natives from the coast of Veracruz, they used to apply it in powder on the skin to remove rats. Um, when they boiled it with water, making some sort of tea, they used to cure feet inflammation with it. And in Chiapas, um, they use it as blush, the Sotzil uh, natives, the girls, scratch a little bit of the mushroom and they place it um, as makeup. Very beautiful. With Saricas in Jalisco, that is a native tribe of the north of Jalisco, they use it to treat fever and skin conditions, preparing a tea that they ground and boil the mushroom with water. Now, in Brazil, perhaps at the end, Mariana can tell us many, many, many more awards. Thank you many more things about the uses of this mushroom in Brazil, but they drink the tea to avoid nightmares. It is a belief in the Amazon tribes. And when food is scarce, they roast it, they leave it to dry in the sun, and then they roast it and eat it. I believe the name they have of the Amazon natives for this mushroom is Urupe de Pau Vermel, which means, um, I believe, blood of, Wood, blood of the tree, blood of the tree in Bermelo is in reference to the bright orange reddish color. 
Toba natives in the north of Argentina mix it in powder form with cork, both powders, to stop bleeding. And in Uruguay, they also use it to stop, to stop bleeding. And they call it Urupenunga Taquapi in Guarani language of the native peoples of Uruguay. And that means what's blue? Blood. 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 What's blood? Because it looks as if the wood was actually bleeding. Now, Africa. This mushroom is widespread also in Africa, and in Gabon, it is used to treat stomach infection, to kill bacteria, to control bacteria. It has many antimicrobial and antibacterial properties. I will tell you about it in a while. In Benin, women, they smoke the mushroom, then they powder it, blend it with onion or chili, and they use it to treat menopause. They eat it that way, to treat menopause. Inside it, they ground it and they mix it with palm oil. And they have the belief that when they rub it on the head of the newborn baby, it will accelerate the process of the cranial maturation. No scientific proof of such thing, but they believe so. And in Australia, they use it to treat mouth conditions. So they grab a little piece of the mushroom, they suck it, and that helps to treat the mouth sores they might have and also to relieve uh, teething pain in babies. Very interesting. These are the main places where we can find Trametus or Vignoborus species. And now the pigment magic. So most of orange pigments in nature are flavonoids and are carotenoids as well. However, not in trametis, these are not carotenoids, like the ones we have, uh, we can find in carrots. These are not carotenoids. So the pigment in this mushroom is not created by synthesis, since the synthesis is the creation of one thing when they, when they build it to. It's created by synthesa because it has, it does not need energy. Biological synthesis in the cell of some species requires the use of ATP, energy from the cell, However, synthasa does not need energy. What it does is that it uses enzyme catalysis. So it is an energy-free process, so to say, because the enzymes create a catalysis and they achieve this phenoxacinone, that's the component, phenoxacinone dye. So in trametis, we have many, many enzymes that decay and decompose wood, lignin, and cellulose. And these are a few of them, lacases, tyrosinases, salobioses, dehydrogenases, kinases, invertases, and silases. Lacases, they have a very, very relevant importance in biotechnology. I will tell you why in a while. Oh, let me erase this. So one thing interesting about the creation of these pigments is that it's not the only species of mushroom or of fungi to use a synthasa pathway to create pigments. This image is a Streptomyces antibioticus. It is a fungi that we use to create um, a streptomycin, a streptomycin, I believe it's in English, antibiotic. And it also uses synthasa to create phenoxycinone pigments because these pigments are related, well, they have antimicrobial activity. I thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Dr. Mariana. And um, yes, so they are, these pigments have a relevance in medicine. Also, this other species is Streptomyces griseus, and it also uses the synthesis pathway to create the pigment, and it also, is used to create antibiotics. So there's an example of convergent evolution between this mushroom species, the Trametis sanguinea with a protein body, and species that do not bear fruit of other fungi, has a streptomyces and antibioticus and griseus. Now, these are the three pigments that we find in the Trametis sanguinea or in the or in the Trametis um, coccinius also, that is the other variety we find in Australia. Trametis sanguine, Tinabarin, 
and cinnabaric acids, that they are phenoxacinone pigments. They are not carotenoids, they are not flavonoids. Now, look at these structures. They are smaller. If you remember the azotide molecule, it was, it looked like the, those three molecules were one bound together. So smaller molecules are better and easier to break down in nature and metabolized by, well, organisms in nature. They do not bioaccumulate like azotides. Ah, trometis has to compete with the lentinus. And actually, uh, every time I find a trometis species, there's a lentinus, a neighbor lentinus in another branch. So they, the pigment they have, these tramesanguine and cinnabarine and cinnabaric acids, they release it and they inhibit growth in lentinus and gloephilum species, which is another type of polypore. So they are the ones that can whoop, dominate the branch. That's the use they have of the pigment, and that's the reason why it is antimicrobial. Yay, Trumpeter Queens. So microremediation, lacases, as I said before, are one of the enzymes that the mushroom uses to create the pigment. And they perform a process that's called one electron oxidation, meaning that they can alter um, pollutants. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it, I'm, I'm shocked at how amazing this mushroom is and how widely distributed it is and the potential we have to use it in microremediation, in medicine, and many other, other areas. So they have the potential to clean water by performing this one electron oxidation in which when they come in touch with the molecules, well, they break them down. And here we, have, here we can see in the, in the illustration, my pen, my pen, from complex and big molecules to small that can be decomposed by other organisms. Traumatis is also capable of, capable of degrading hydrocarbons, palm oil, oil itself, petroleum. It can be used to remediate oil spills. Potential biotechnological applications. Well, it has been proven that in humans, the pigments of traumatis sanguinea, when you extract, when it's extracted, can fight the E. coli bacteria. It has an antibiotic effect. The Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is related to meningitis, endophthalmitis, pneumonia, and liver abscesses and necrotizing skin. And it could also help inhibit the growth of Salmonella, Staphylococcus aureus, and Streptococcus. So it is amazing what a mushroom can do for humans. And for plants, well, this species is Xanthosomas cam campestris. And this is a bean leaf. These are bean crops from uh, Michoacan. So this other species that invades the leaf is Xanthomonas campestris, and it is practically killing the plants, the, the bean plants. So what scientists did, let me raise these things. I get excited with the pen. It's so much fun. Is that they, in Michoacan, there is a lot of Trometis sanguinea species that are growing in the wild. So they took wild strains, they inoculated them, made them grow, then they extracted the pigments. And here are the petri dishes in which a single pigment drop is inhibiting the growth of Xanthomonas, Xanthomonas campestris. So it is working, the trametis sanguine and the cinnabaric acids are working as antibiotics to these other species that well eats and kills the bean plants. Whoa, whoa, I know, amazing. Let's have some traumatis <laughs> antibiotics, please. I will I will definitely eat those. And that's that's amazing. So again, traumatis wins. And at last but not least, yes, we can clone it and have it as a pet. Chris Ritson is an amazing artist based in Honolulu, Hawaii. Check his Instagram, Chris Ritson, his webpage, Chris Ritson. And he clones wild species to create this amazing art. He is a master of the fruiting traumatis, and he even makes some other exploration pieces. 
like the one we have in here. And that will be all. I'm going to change my camera so we can see the results. And stop sharing. If there are any questions, comments, anything, you are very welcome to share them. Um, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the ethnomycology you covered so well. Um, actually, the Urupe Nungata Kwapi, that's very correct. Uh, it's uh, the Guarani group of Sao Paulo state of Brazil. Wow. That call them, it's uh, actually the translation is uh, blood of the wood because oh. it is the wood where, where the mycelium is growing. And they use it as a powder for the babe teething as well, uh, the natives here in Brazil. And all, all the rest that you said, it's it's so on point. It was a wonderful, um, my my dye is really working. I, I just want to show you a little. Yes, whoa. <laughs> I dyed a, a mushroom t-shirt that I had here. <laughs> and used the yeah, thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mariana. I'm, I'm so, so grateful that you were able to attend. I admire all the work you do. You know, I'm one of your great sons. <laughs> and I admire so much your work. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Let's see what we have in here. Oh, this is hot. Oh, fucking hot. Ah. Now, as you can see, this fabric is really thin. So there might be marks. How is your t-shirt, Marie? Can you show it to us? Or do, does it need more time in the dye box? Mm -hmm. I think it needs a little bit more time and it's actually really hot as well. So oh. let me see. Well, let's wait a little longer. Here. It needs a little bit more time. Oh. So we have the first cloth here. And we have this beautiful pattern only using the thumb depressors and the rubber bands. We have one pattern here on this way. Now, let's see what happened to the other ones. I'm curious about this one. Remember, this is the Harashi Shibori. Oh, look, it got the pink from yesterday's Brazil wood dye. Here we have a very interesting effect. You can see now the places where the fabric was closer to the wood is about the color, but I just want you to see, I don't know if you can see this effect. Wow. This looks really, really pretty. Now we don't have any color here, but this is totally fully worth it and we have it in both sides. Place. Oh, the one we hold has a triangle. Let's remove all of this. This looks nice. Now, remember, this is recycled cotton, and recycled cotton does not have leeches on it. So, the beige of the fabric created some sort of brown, yellow color. It does not look pure bright yellow because we had a basic, basic color. Oh, this is interesting. Look, we created squares using a triangle. How crazy is that? Beautiful. Beautiful. Now the place is in here. And the final one, I, I, I fear this might not have a pattern because the fabric is really thin. Oh, very, very tiny one. 
Because the pressure was not so much. Mm. The other ones here. And these are the best results. So, best results will be always achieved using wood because you can apply more pressure and avoid certain parts of the fabric. To be done. Well, and our legal thoughts. Oh. Oh. You know, results. Does no, anyone else have any um, comments to make or want to say hi? Hi, I'm Ed. Uh, hi, hey. Elena. <laughs> I want to show you a little bit about how was our mix. I don't know if we use a lot of bonato, but it's extremely perfect, the color. I don't know. Whoa. It's right. It's the right red. It's like a completely, let me show you. Oh, wow. And what, um, what uh, did you use the mushroom as well for the pigment? No, no, because we never found it. We was looking here. We are in Connecticut. And we was looking around, but any anything that any luck to have the the There's mushroom. Another one, marigolds. Yeah, we you, we use the marigold. Ah, oh, perfect. Uh, and the anato. That that was the only thing. And I don't know, Jimena, you remember the flower that I told you, the dandelion lion? Yes. Okay. We 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 put a uh, hundred grams, hundred grams, yeah, hundred grams of of that one. I don't know if that changed the color or yeah, not. I think we need a more but yeah, <laughs> definitely. Wow. Okay, on this one, let me show. Oh, wow. it's so it's bright. It's perfect. It's, it's oh, like a... right. Beautiful. So this was a combination, you said, of marigold and dandelion, or? Yeah. The uh, marigold, dandelion, and anato, and a show thing. you used to oh. Wow, well, that's, that's <laughs> a <light bulb>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's really good. That experiment. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, really good, because you have more compounds interacting and attaching to the fiber at different energy levels. That's okay, why the color that, is so bright. Okay, copy. So that's why it's so bright, right? Yes. Okay, okay. Let me open another one. Beautiful. I'm so glad that some of y'all were able to die along. We're dying along together. Decomposing <laughs> <laughs> together. <laughs> can, can I show something I made with Wode? Yes. This is a shibori oh. with Wode, a salt method, and uh uh, soy milk mm. as a mordant on silk. Oh, silk. Oh, that's so beautiful. Beautiful. It makes a pretty beautiful green. I love it. Yes. It's really beautiful. I didn't have time to get it together today, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing, Mary. Those are really beautiful results. Thank you. I try to not use chemicals. Yes, it's better always. The only chemical I, I use is um, the alum because I have a five-year-old son. So there only have to be safe things back in my place. There's a, there's a washing material you can use called um, Synthropol. But uh, yes. but but they stopped making it. So now they make sort of a Dharma Trader company makes uh, a sort of uh, more um, natural mm -hmm. scouring detergent that's recommended. I'm about to buy some, but I haven't quite run out of the Synthetol yet. I'll, but I'll I sorry. but I wash everything out into so I do gray water in the yard. So I can't really put any chemicals in my bathtub or yes. or, or washer. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm not gonna, I don't know where I'd dispose them. <laughs> yes. No, and it's always better. <laughs> yeah. To not use those. So. Mm -hmm. It's hard because everybody uses them and there's not a lot of information about um, different options. Mm -hmm. Or how to dispose them. Um, many people use alum sulfate, which is a powder, another, that's a chemical form of alum, but I've never used it for the same reasons, because it goes into the water and the water goes everywhere. So it is always better to avoid the use of chemicals. And Mariana, she used banana leaves as a mordant. I'm going to have to try that. Um, from, I, I believe from the, from the trunk. Peel. From the oh, peel or from the trunk? Or the trunk. Mariana, are you there? Can you tell us your experience using banana as a modern agent? Yeah, so uh, I learned in Guatemala with uh, some wonderful Mayan women, uh, indigenous women, that <clears throat> they used the banana uh, trunk from uh, the half down. They just uh, And they just boiled the trunk uh, for like an hour in a big pot with water and that that's their mordant for making their their dyes over there not the peels no uh what, no not the peels they use the trunk of the banana we have a lot of bananas in guatemala and in brazil so there is an abundance of of that and every time you harvest the banana you you actually cut down the whole trunk so you it's really the banana is actually the, the, the tree that you see, is just one leaf of a banana. It's actually just leaves. The, 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 the body of like the real trunk of the banana is underground. We used to have a lot of bananas, but we've had a big freezing event the last few years and all our bananas have gone, died to the ground. Okay, yeah. We don't have that problem over here. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, I can see Ed is unwrapping, unknotting, unfolding. Does anybody else want to say hi or share, make a comment? This has been so wonderful. I'm glad to light it. Yes. Can we show can't... another one? We can't wait for the next talk. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to dig deeper into the science and beauty of mushroom pigments. And yeah. we're working here in Texas to start getting some cultivation of this mushroom going. So um, we want to be able to have a workshop in person where we have is it, they're, the, the mushrooms here. It's just not super common you know we are dry sometimes and we're now in a drought so we probably won't see a lot of fruiting of this mushroom so you can grow a lot of other dye plants here like the indigo and the woad and the cosmo and the marigold and awesome. those are all flowering right now in abundance and cop and coreopolis those do well and uh, they all work well mm -hmm. yes cosmo flowers Cosmos sulfurios also give a bright red color to the fabric. However, marigold is more light fast than Cosmos flowers. Mm. But you can use them together. Cosmos, they are so pretty. And they are perfect, you know, for what? For hapasome, which is a technique where you place the flower, hammer it into the fabric, and they create these beautiful patterns. Oh, uh, you can use calendula. I Oh, sumac. that's beautiful. Makes a beautiful pink, sumac. Ah, oh, it's sumac. This is a wax, wax, wax resist. Yeah, sumac. Uh, and is that silk? It works so good. No, this is actually cotton. Ah, uh, cotton with sumac. It's a nice brownish I, shade, but it's got a little pinks and, and other. You know. It's really beautiful. I eat a lot of sumac. It's I will make this. Yes. Um, Christine, you asked. I planted a few sumac trees. Ah, sorry, Christine is asking, could you use calendula flowers? Yes, but the color is very pale. Calendula flowers, even though the orange ones, 
will give you more pale shades than marigold or anato, but you can use them. You can use them with silk or with cotton that is not bleach, recycled cotton that has this beige kind of color, and it will create a beautiful deeper shade of yellow using calendula flowers that are more common in any naturalist shops. Calendula because you can use them also for many things in health. I've got good results from uh, mallow flowers. Ah, uh, mallow flowers, yes. They can also. Most of the things we have around can die, even chamomile. Chamomile gives a very beautiful yellow in, in wool. Well, it's actually the same, dried off fresh flowers. If you use fresh flowers, you will have to use double the, the, um, the amount because, well, they shrink. Mm. Well, I prefer to use dried flowers, and this is why. Before you boil the flower, even marigold, calendula, or any type of flower for dye, if it's dried, you can separate the petals and extract the seeds. And if you have the seeds, you can have your own or cats, your own dye garden, and separate the petals for dyes. If you have the fresh flowers, maybe the seeds are not pollinated still, and you will have to boil everything. So I prefer dried flowers. Hmm. I do more of an echo print where I wrap the fresh or dried flowers in the like a roll, like a copper roll and just boil it, steam it really, not boil it. Okay, yes. And that way it leaves a print on there and then you can use either way. I get better results, honestly, from fresh. Mm -hmm. If you do echo printing, yes. Because you have to re rotate the petals if you want to use them for echo printing. Oh, show us it. There's yeah, we, have, we have one question. Yes. When we already unfolded uh, the clothes, like a, we just put on the on the shelf or something to dry or yes okay. let it air dry avoid sunlight avoid direct sunlight because sunlight destroys everything <laughs> it, it con la, con la, i'm sorry i'm speaking spanish um <laughs> this one was with the marble bowl oh yeah create concentric circles yeah and i, I we put like a, the half half with the marble bowl and then with the that is a very interesting result Oh, mm -hmm. gorgeous. Really beautiful. Gorgeous color. Mm -hmm. And the other one, what was the other one? Which one? Oh, this one. Esta fue con el cubo. No. Oh, that's pretty. Mm. Well, maybe, I don't know if we need less time on the... And more pressure. Yeah, on, on more pressure, definitely. More pressure, definitely more pressure. More pressure? That's what happened to me here. Uh, I like that one. That one was with the marble, right? With the marble? No, book? this one was with the clamp. With these clamps. But my fabric is That's really it. thin. Okay. So it was not enough pressure to leave it fully white. You just cut like this. But it's cool. I can use it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and this one was with the with the wood with the cube cube wood with this one. So we use this one. It's like a oh, that's so pretty. For soft lines. Now subtle patterns are also beautiful because they make they make you take a deeper look at the fabric. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Oh, Christine, I'm so glad you liked it and that we are giving you life. Go and grab some potash alum or banana trunks to mold onto your fabrics. Well, thanks so much for coming. That was wonderful. Yes. Thank you. All right. Good to talk about dying. Yeah. We're all about dying and decomposing <laughs> yeah, between them, right? <laughs> yeah, the rot and the mold. Yes, I loved um, Juliana's recent comments about let it rot. Let it rot, yes. That was a very good- um, It's hard for people. 
let things rot. Let them sit and rot. They just like got to clean it up. It's really like an obsession. Mm -hmm. It's very yeah. Western, Western mindset. We've got to undo lots of work. Wow. I don't, I don't understand. People really like, they panic. It's in their, yeah. it's upsetting to them. You know, like, yeah. let that go. Keep spread, keep talking about it and keep uh, making a mess. <laughs> and get away with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the big part. Get away with it. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the example. Yes. <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming out. We can't wait to see you next time. And thanks everyone for tuning in from all over the, the, the map. Um, so yeah, so everyone have another, uh, have a lovely Sunday and we will touch base again soon. Thank you all. Thank you, Amina. Thank you. Come and we go to the cenotes, the safe ones. Yes. Oh, I'm tempted. It's beautiful. You're all welcome. It was, we, yeah, it was a fun trip. It was hard to get around transportation. We didn't have a car, so we did lots of alternative things like hitchhiking. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Which worked out, but at the time we were, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Thank Bye you, now. Angel. Thank you, Ed, Mariana.